Okay, we we derived or at least defined these Fourier different Fourier transforms. Here's the Fourier transform. Here's the sine transform. Here's the cosine transform. And on the right are all their inverse transforms. So we already went through that in previous recordings. Um, if you took the Fourier transform, say, of F prime, the derivative of F with respect to X, you would put that in this formula here, put in F prime here instead of F of X, and do the uh, integration by parts. And if you did it again, you would come up with this formula for the Fourier transform of the second derivative. You just multiply the Fourier transform of the function itself by minus alpha squared. If you did similar things for the sine transform, the second derivative, it would be this. It's still multiplied by minus alpha squared, but you tack on this initial condition. Similarly for the cosine, transform. So we have um, these transforms of a second derivative. And we're going to use all this to solve certain partial differential equations. And when we do partial differential equations, we're talking about a function of two variables. You can take the Fourier transform with respect to one of those variables. That would just mean this. So if, if the time or original function is lowercase u, we'll call the uh, Fourier transform big U. And in this case, we did it with respect to x. So the argument instead of x is going to be alpha here. So this just means the Fourier transform of this guy with respect to x. What are the partial derivatives the, excuse me, the transforms, the Fourier transforms of the partial derivatives of this lowercase u with respect to the other variable, the one you didn't take the Fourier transform with respect to. Well, let's see. Ed says put this, well, this is what you put inside the integral, the definition. By Leibniz rule, you can pull out this partial derivative in front of the integral because the uh, limits allow that. <laughs> and this just means the partial derivative of big U, the Fourier transform with respect to X. So it's an easy way to take the Fourier transform of the derivative with respect to the other variable. And the second derivative is just this. It's just plain old partial derivative of big U with respect to U. Um, you can do that with all the transforms. So what we now have here down in the bottom is what you would put on a formula sheet. Um, Fourier transform of the second derivative with respect to X, given that we're gonna take the Fourier transform with respect to X, this, just like we were on the previous page. It's always minus alpha squared times the Fourier transform and the sine and cosine have this additional tacked on initial condition. And the Fourier transforms of the partial derivatives with respect to the other variable are just these partial derivatives of the big U. So let's do an example. Let's do an infinite rod example. And by the way, you use this when if you remember, the other examples we did of partial differential equations using product method, I believe in every case it was over a finite extent, like the length of a heated rod or a, a, a vibrating string or something like that, finite extent. You'll use this method, Fourier transform methods, when the extent of the variable is either infinite or semi-infinite. Here we have an infinite rod. Semi-infinite means from zero to one of the infinities. This one is 
all the way over the whole real line, minus infinity to infinity. Um, but for positive time. Well, here's the partial differential equation itself. Here is an initial condition. It says at time zero, um, the infinite rod has certain heat described by this function. Constant minus two to two and zero everywhere else. So what does that heat do in this rod as time goes on? Here's how we do the method. We take Fourier transforms of each term in this equation, term by term. Remember the Fourier transform of U, and we're going to do it with respect to that. And I'll tell you how to figure out which variable and uh, which, which transform in a bit later. But if we do it, take the Fourier transform with respect to X. What was the Fourier transform of the second derivative? It was minus alpha squared times this big U, the Fourier transform of the function itself. So we have K times this guy. Remember the partial of U with respect to T, the Fourier transform of it is just partial of U with respect to T. We're gonna treat alpha as a constant, basically. So that's just the total derivative of U, first derivative of U with respect to T. Now we can rearrange terms. Say, well, pull all this stuff to one side, set it to zero, then we have a du plus this, k alpha squared u. This is an ordinary differential equation in u, big U, and we know it's um, solution. This is just a first order equation. So that means big U, which is a function of alpha now, and is this format. Right? This is the general solution to this kind of equation. We also need to take the Fourier transform of the initial. And let's see, the Fourier transform of little u at zero is, oops. Fourier transform of this initial condition, little u x at time zero is this f of x. Well, that Fourier transform is the Fourier transform of this, this function. And that equals the initial Fourier transform, this big u alpha at time zero. So they both equal the same thing. And we found in a previous recording, we found the Fourier transform of this function. I'll just tell you what it is. It's this right here. A previous example. That tells us what A is. Because what is what is this big U at time zero? Well, when this T is zero, this E thing is just one, and we're just left with A. So this tells us what the big A is up here. So now we have the Fourier transform of the solution. We don't have the solution just yet, but we have its Fourier transform. So now we need to take the inverse transform. So the, the solution we're looking for is the inverse transform, what we just had. And here is what an inverse transform is from a formula sheet, from those definitions earlier. Plug in the U we had. Here's what we had. So let's see how far we can get with simplifying this integral. Um, well, for one thing, I could say, well, this is the answer. But we want a real solution because everything we're talking about is real. So we don't like this complex term here. Um, so we'll use Euler's formula and rewrite this part of it in terms of cosine and sine, right? So all this thing does is replace um, this with cosine and sine. Really for you. Then we could rearrange terms, and here they all are. I could do things the cheating way. 
say everything that's imaginary goes away, but we shouldn't do that because we might have made a mistake. So let's be careful. Um, we'll use our knowledge of even and odd functions. Now, sine is an odd function, and, and it's with respect to whatever the variable of integration is, which is alpha, uh, d alpha here. So are things odd or even with respect to alpha? Sine of something alpha is odd. Alpha is alpha to the first power, odd power. That's odd as well. Odd divided by odd is even. This has an alpha squared, so it's even. Cosine of something alpha is even. If I have all evens times evens, it's ultimately an even. Here, on the other hand, we have odd over odd, so that part's even. This part's even. The sign is odd. We have an even times even, which is even. Then times an odd. Even times an odd is an odd. Over a symmetric interval, this whole thing goes away. It becomes zero. I have to double check that it's not just, oh, just throw out the imaginary part. So I'm left with this part. And there it is. And since it is even, instead of integrating from minus infinity to infinity, I can integrate from zero to infinity as long as I multiply by two. So I got rid of that. Here is the final answer to that problem. Now, I'll, I'm going to be doing a lot more examples using all three of these different tra transforms. Fourier transform, the cosine transform, the sine transform. What I found is one of the more subtle points to all this is knowing what variable do you take the transform with respect to and which transform do you use? If you've got a function of two variables, three different transforms, you've got six different ways you could try to go about this. You don't want to do trial and error at least any more than you need to. Um, I think I'll go over this the next time. What I just went through is one basic example of using the Fourier transform to solve portion of the